Welcome back to our series on how we got the Bible. In this session, we want to look at how did we get all these different kinds of translations, where they come from. Now, in order to understand where they came from, first we need to have some idea of what is it that we're trying to accomplish when we read the Bible. And for that, I think we can turn to the first psalm. And in the first psalm, uh, we are told that what distinguishes the righteous man, what makes him like a tree planted by the living water, is that he delights in the law of the Lord and he meditates on it day and night. Now, the key word for us is meditates on it. So uh, meditation is this idea of being very thoughtful, full of thought, and you're full of thought about the word of God. It's always in your mind. You're always contemplating it. And in order to do that, you need to be able to read it, not only to like skim it, not only to just read it and go, okay, I read today's portion, let's go to the next thing. But you have to be able to read it, understand it, and then hold it in your mind and uh, turn it over in your mind, as it were. So it's not enough simply to be able to skim through the Bible and say, okay, I got through my chapter today. Uh, you actually have to be able to understand what it's saying in a way that, that you're able to think about it and to draw applications and conclusions and connections between it. And so that's where, uh, as um, things developed in terms of the ease of uh, creating translations and publishing them and all of this, all of that begins to become easier. Uh, also, people begin to think, well, how can we best enable people to meditate on it? How can we help them to understand it? And there are basically three different schools of translation that have formed thus far. It's important to note that these represent points along a spectrum. So um, it's not as though you have three categories and you can just lump all of these in here and uh, you know, an NIV is the same as an ESV, it's the same as the NASV, but these are three different points along a spectrum, and uh, the NIV is kind of in between two of them, and then to one direction of that is the ESV, and a little further that way is the NSV. So it's not as though they fall exactly on that point all the time, but they cluster around these points to a certain extent. Um, we're going to start from one end of the spectrum, and we're going to work our way towards the other. So we're going to start with what's called functional equivalency. It's also called paraphrase. And this philosophy of translation uh, comes out of this understanding that people don't have the cultural background of the Bible. So they don't understand things like the tension between the Samaritans and the Jews in order to understand the fullness of the parable of the Good Samaritan. And so in this philosophy, you take uh, the Good Samaritan and you take the Jew and you change them into a cultural equivalent of the modern day. So you, uh, you translate everything into the contemporary cultural colloquium. Uh, so, for example, in the Cotton Patch Gospel, uh, which takes the gospel and it moves the setting from uh, Israel in the first century and it puts it down in the Deep South in the middle of the last century. And so instead of a Samaritan, you have an African-American gentleman. And then, uh, instead of a Jew, you have a white gentleman. And uh, so now you've basically taken the, the meaning of that as best you can. You've translated it into something that your readers can easily identify with and understand uh, the fullness of it. So they're changing everything. They're still trying to get at the original meaning. But in order to get at it and make it clear, they are going to change everything from the words are going to be updated to modern words. And the imagery is going to be updated. The setting is going to be updated. Everything is going to be updated here. Some examples of this are the Cotton Patch Gospel, which we just mentioned. And to uh, maybe a lesser extent, the message also follows this idea. Now, if we move down the line, we get to dynamic equivalent, which is kind of the in-between uh, of the three 
philosophies we're looking at. And this seeks to translate thought for thought while promoting readability. So they're not going word for word. They just want to get the meaning of the text right. They're not going to go so far as to say, well, people don't have the cultural background, so we need to change all of that. Uh, but they are going so far as, as to say, we need to make this readable, we need to make the thoughts clear. And probably the leading example of this in our day and age would be the New Living Translation. And before that, the Living Translation also sought to do this. Now, there's also something called optimal equivalency, which is between dynamic and formal, which we'll look at next. This is a relatively new kid on the block. And uh, this is the philosophy that was followed in the Holman Christian Standard Bible and now the Christian Standard Bible. And what uh, they're trying to do is they're trying to hit the perfect middle ground between thought for thought and the readability and the clarity that brings, but also the precision and the accuracy of a formal equivalent. Uh, so they're kind of blending the different techniques. And in the introduction to the Christian Standard Bible, they tell you there are some passages where for the sake of readability and clarity, we're going thought for thought. And uh, there are other passages where we're going word for word uh, when that seems to be just as good. Uh, so they're trying to get the best of both worlds. And we should note at this point, that's really what all of these people are trying to do. They're all trying to give you access to the meaning of the Bible, and they're just approaching it in different ways. They're emphasizing different things. Well, the formal equivalence, it is going to seek the most literal rendering, word for word, uh, though some compromise is present. So when you're trying to translate from Hebrew and Aramaic and Greek, the grammatical structures and the syntax, the way that they construct their sentences, uh, if you were to translate it exactly into English, it would it would be confusing, and uh, you can get even a New American Standard Bible, which is probably as much in this camp as you can get at the moment, and there will be a lot of portions where the wording uh, is difficult to read and even difficult to wrap your head around exactly what's going on because the order of things is not what we are used to. There are also... Uh, places in which the Greek word, there's no way to get one word that fully encompasses the meaning in English. So there, there are some words we just don't have a direct equal to. Uh, the one that comes to my mind is the word makarios, which you'll find in the Beatitudes. We usually translate it as blessed, some translate it as happy, both of which get the gist of it, but the fullness of it it's a technical term, and it comes from Greek philosophy, and its idea is of the good life, and not the good life like in terms of lifestyle and a rich and famous good life, but the good life is in what the Greek philosophers were trying to find out, the most virtuous, the best way to live, the optimal way of approaching life. And when you get the fullness of that meaning, it really sets up what Jesus is about to do in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, he, he's not just uh, telling you God is going to grant you these certain privileges, these certain gifts, if you live this way. He's telling you this is the definitive philosophy for life. Uh, we could also think of Logos from John, or Logos from John 1, 1, and we translate that the word, and um, that might be the literal equivalent. But in terms of meaning, there's a little more with lagos than there is with the English equivalent word. So there, there are some places where you just can't quite do it in one word where the Greek has one word. And there's some places where if you're going to preserve the ordering of the words and the grammatical structure, uh, it's going to be more difficult to read in English. So there's always, even in the New American Standard, there's some places where some compromise becomes unavoidable for the sake of readability. And now, as we said, the New American Standard is about as hard in this camp as you can get. And then 
just a little bit more toward optimal equivalence, I would say, is the English Standard Version, which happens to be what I typically use in my teaching and preaching, uh, just because I, I find it to still be very accurate. Um, but it's also easier for me to read it than the New American Standard. And that brings up the question, well, what is best? Which translation do I need? If I have to have only one, what should it be? And this depends on our application and to some extent our personal preferences. So it, it's not as though we can hold up one and go, the NASB is the most formal of all equivalents and therefore it is the one Bible that we must go from. Uh, and if we begin to do something like that, uh, then we have in some way made an idol either out of that translation itself or out of the principles behind it. And that's not good and it's not helpful. Uh, so we shouldn't seek to, to say there can only be one, okay? Uh, Bible translations are not Highlander. There can be more than one. And indeed, I would encourage us to use more than one. And I myself try to use more than one. Now, all that being said, there are a few considerations that can help us sift through some of these because there are a lot of translations uh, that we really should avoid. There are a lot of translations that we just don't need. And so there are a few things we can look at that will help us to understand. Uh, we want a translation by a reputable group. Uh, so. We are Protestants, and we are Evangelical Protestants, so we would not want a translation that is uh, coming out of a Catholic background. That would not be very helpful to us. We wouldn't want a translation that's coming out of a liberal Protestant background. That would be not very helpful to us. We certainly don't want a translation that comes out of what we would consider to be a cult. So we don't want the New World Translation or Joseph Smith's edition of the King James uh, Bible or the Passion Translation. We wouldn't want these things uh, because they're going to introduce errant ideas and they're going uh, to uh, to read into the Bible errant traditions. We, we want a reputable group. Uh, we want something that's coming out of a good faith tradition. We want it to be by committee. So uh, even if you got like your favorite guy, like John MacArthur comes out with a Bible all on his own. I don't want MacArthur's translation of the Bible by MacArthur uh, because there's going to be too much MacArthur in it. And yes, there is such a thing as too much MacArthur. You want a translation by committee, and the bigger the committee, uh, the better. So if you have one guy or five guys or even ten guys, uh, there's a lot more opportunity for the individual ideas and notions and predispositions of these men and women to filter into the text. For if you have a hundred men or more, uh, now you have more of a balance. There's enough voices feeding into this thing uh, that it's going to be more difficult for one person or one side to completely dominate the translation process and to filter in their own predispositions and notions on what the text says. And we want something that we can read and understand. So uh, if you cannot easily sit down and look at the King James and go, ah, this is what it means, uh, then you shouldn't be reading the King James. It's, if you're stumbling over uh, the passages in the NASB, uh, that shouldn't be your primary Bible. You want to be able to sit down and you want to be easily able to get some meaning of the text. Now, how do we determine these things? How do we know if it's coming from a reputable group? How do we know what the committee is? Well, that's what the front matter is for. Uh, so when you pick up a new Bible, the first thing that you want to look at is the introduction and the notes on the translation. And that's going to give you a lot of information on how it's being approached. So uh, for example, a good translation is going to talk about the divine inspiration of the word right away. It's going to talk about the inerrancy of the word right away. 
Uh, whereas if it's coming from a secular tradition, I mean, it's probably just going to say something about the Bible's historical importance or how it influenced a lot of lives or something like that. Uh, it's going to lay out the translation philosophy as a sort of formal equivalent, as a functional equivalent. Is it somewhere in between those? What are they trying to do here? How are they approaching this? It's going to tell you the committee, and it'll probably give you even more notes. Um, like the CSB, when it came out, there had been a lot of discussion and talk and even controversy about gender pronouns in the Bible. And so there's a specific note in there that says this is how we have handled this and this is why we handle it that way. And so those things are very helpful. I would also say look at the notes. Um, some people, and the last guy that I worked for before I came to Grace Bible Church, um, he kind of became of this opinion where they'll, uh, he would hold up the Bible and uh, he would point out like this little section up here at the top which is like a fourth of the page this is the word of God and these three fourths at the bottom are the word of men well I want more of the word of God than the word of men now for his purpose where you're preaching I agree I don't need a whole bunch of notes getting in the way of the text I'm trying to read but for study I want the translator's notes there because I want to know what they were thinking and if there are some manuscripts that differ I want to know what the difference is um, so look at the notes, and you, you probably want extensive notes for your primary study Bible. Another opinion of mine that I will offer up is that you don't want to paraphrase as your primary text. Now, if you find it helpful, if you find that the Cotton Patch Gospel helps you to get some of these concepts because you haven't fully integrated the biblical backgrounds and that historical information, that's fine. If you find that it's a, a better place to read large portions, if it can enhance your understanding, that's good. But if that's what you're bringing into Sunday school uh, and to the sermons that you're listening to, if that's what you're following along in, um, what you're doing your primary study in, I would kind of push back against that and say get something that's a, a little more grounded in the original because the time and the place, the setting of the Bible was just as inspired as the word. God could have put Jesus in the deep south in uh, the middle of the 20th century if he had wanted to, but he chose first century Israel and he chose it for a reason. And I would also advise use more than one translation uh, have it two or three that you look at pretty regularly that you're going to turn to when your primary translation isn't satisfying you the lord has given us a plethora of translations and while sometimes that can seem like more than a burden and uh, while it's true that we probably have more than we really need uh, the fact that we have more than one, that um, that we have more than one approach to it, this is good. Uh, these different approaches can work in combination, in concert with one another, to enhance our Bible study. And let's pray that it would do just that. Lord, we thank you uh, that you have not only inspired the original word of Scripture, but you have also inspired men down through the generations to create translations even up into the present times so that we have the Bible in a language that any of us can easily pick up and understand. Lord, we thank you that you have inspired men to approach the text in different ways and to, to try to clarify the meaning in these different approaches. Lord, we pray that we would make the best use of the tools you have given us, uh, that we would be wise and discerning and careful and the Bibles that we trust, but we would not uh, become so fixated on one translation, on one version, or one philosophy that it becomes an idol uh, to us and a stumbling block to our brothers and sisters. Lord, let us do according to your will, to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.